Welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here. And I promise that you are in for a treat. I've had the pleasure of meeting Yannick and have him was at our club meeting last year. He was a, quite a very gifted and talented bonsai artist. Let me give you a little background on Yannick. Yannick Keegan has been adept at bonsai since the age of 10. He started young. And two years later, he started his journey with lessons from various bonsai masters, including Japanese masters. Uh, your, you know, is that that's not uh, Komenashi? Take a Ko, Kawabe? Yes. Help me if I'm saying them wrong. No, you're saying it right. So. Hatsumi Terakawa, and Polish bonsai artist Mario Komsta and Belgian Bonsai Studio Momiji, and um, Pius Nodder, and Francois Yacker. He's also participated in various ex exhibitions, such as the No Lunders Trophy, the Ginkgo Award, and the European Bonsai Sand Show. He's coming to us tonight, or early morning in his case, um, from Belgium. Um, in 2011, he founded Yama Bonsai Studio to promote bonsai, share his knowledge and skills with both beginners and advanced people who are passionate about these beautiful trees. This is done through courses, workshops, demonstrations, lectures, and sales. Um, my club and several other clubs is very lucky. We're going to have him in October coming to the States for a while. Mm -hmm. And uh, he'll also be at the Bonsai, uh, Bonsai Pacific Expo. And um, you are going to, I want to forewarn you guys, you're going to hear a, a term that it took me a couple of times before I figured out what it was. He says foliage clouds. I love it. That's pads in, in, in our um, neck of the woods. But uh, I love the foliage clouds. So... Uh, Yannick, take it away, and we're looking forward to hearing your presentation. Okay, so I want to thank you all for inviting me. I'm looking forward to doing this lecture and also to come in uh, October. Uh, I will say a little bit about myself. I'm Yannick Kege. I started indeed at the age of 10 years old. Then when I was 12 years, I started to work for uh, Jean-Paul Polmans, who had or has a uh, bonsai studio Momiji in, in Diepenbeek. And he's quite a good professional in Belgium. Um, then when I I started to work for him, and uh, I followed together with him also several workshops with Mario Komsta, Pius Notter, uh, Hotsumi Terakawa. And then after that, I went to Japan um, to study with Kunio Kobayashi in uh, Tokyo Itagawa Kun. And then later on, I started my own business, Yama Bonsai. First was Yama Bonsai Studio, now it's Yama Bonsai. Uh, I guess we had to change from one man business to a corporation. Um, and I still try to learn a lot about Bonsai because I think Bonsai is a learning experience. Uh, when you stop learning, uh, how do I have to say it? That, that, that then it just stop, stops, actually. So, uh, I think you you can learn about bonsai and trees and nature until until um, <laughs> until you, uh, you you pass away actually. So uh, so it's it's important to always keep keep on learning and you can learn from everyone. So and I think it's very important that you can take your pieces from everybody a little bit and do your own thing with it. And that's what I'm I, I want to explain today as well. Um, because I think you start to work in bonsai or you start to work with a, with a bonsai master and you take all those knowledge and after a while when you've done or, or, or what, I don't know if it's like copying him, but, but afterwards when you can style a tree like him more or less, you start to develop your own, own style. And this is something that's also important. I think when you have your... Uh, when your technique is done properly, you can head into a different direction. And that's something that I want to talk to you guys as well about. Uh, 
And that's why I have this subject that bonsai styling is a, a own unique approach and preference. And that's how time, countries, and schools influence bonsai around the world. And also sometimes if you have like, uh, how do you actually say it? Uh, popular things at times or popular uh, things. So if you guys have any uh, questions, you just type it in the in the chat and I will try to answer them. Uh, I don't have, have all the knowledge, so I try to, to explain as, as, as good as possible. Uh, you can... I'm going to explain a little bit about the bonsai rules and et cetera, and how bonsai started. So bonsai styling, an old unique approach and preference. Over time, countries, schools influence bonsai around the world. Uh, bonsai started in China. And while the word of bonsai is in Japanese origin, the concept of this art actually comes from or took root in China since the Yin and Zhao dynasty nearly 3,000 years ago. People in China have cultivated ornamental plants to in imitate natural scenery within gardens. And in China, they call this panji. Uh, so this is what you see or still see quite a lot, because in China, bonzo is also popular, but we're going to talk about that a little bit later as well. And I'm going to show you guys a few examples of how bonsai in China looks. Uh, then during, uh, during some time, uh, Japan uh, took Tianjin to their country and uh, made it made it better or in their understanding more natural and, 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 and better for them. There's a history of bonsai in Japan and it's believed that the first tray landscapes were brought from China to Japan at least 1200 years ago as religious uh, souvenirs. A thousand years ago, the first lengthy work of fiction in Japanese included this passage. A full-sized tree is left growing in its natural state as a crude thing. It is only when it is kept close to human beings who fashion it with love and care that its shape and style acquire the ability to move on. So from there on, uh, it, it was a sort of a, a bubble time. And in Japan, they had a lot of money. They had a good time and they started to philo to do philosophy about nature and bonsai. And they wanted to bring nature close to their places. So what they did is if they saw a beautiful rock somewhere, they wanted to put that rock in their garden, but as it lay in nature, so they wouldn't put it down or, or, or put it in a different position. So. They wanted to have nature closer, closer to, to their homes. And during that time also, you can see it on the scrolls that you have like a lot of bunjing kind of types of trees. And we're going to talk about that school a little bit later as well. But it started more or less with, with a very linear kind, kind, kind of trees. And it's only since after the war that uh, <clears throat> bonsai started to get more rules. Also because, uh, how do I have to say it? Um, there was ally, allied occupation in, in Japan and they wanted to know more about bonsai. And also they gave these teachings about bonsai. Uh, they, they brought this to other countries. So before the war, uh, bonsai and import was already thriving. And then the war in Europe started, actually. And, um, and that was in 1940 somewhere. And in 1941, uh, the Asia Pacific War started and many trees were destroyed, many buildings, etc. as well. But during these allied occupation of Japan, which continued through 1952, Many uh, American officers were stationed in Japan together with their families. And to spend their time, it was common among the wives of the military to take courses in the traditional arts and crafts, including bonsai and bonte. These courses, which were arranged by the US military, helped spread the knowledge of bonsai to North America. And thanks to Yuji Yoshimura, um, I hope I pronounced the name right. 
1952, the son of a Japanese bonsai master who uh, collaborated with a German diplomat, ultra and bonsai aficionado Alfred Kuhn, to arrange bonsai demonstrations uh, and that they would be open to the public and accessible even for foreigners. And that's how it started, that bonsai knowledge started to, to, to go abroad as well. And this is now I'm going to tell you a little bit about the uh, about schools. Also, I'm going to present some people in the bonsai world, some a uh, few people from America, a few people from Europe. Uh, I also want to tell you that uh, I have a big appreciation for everyone in the bonsai world. Uh, and maybe I forget to name some people. Maybe I uh, I'm I'm going to tell my idea about their styling, about how they create bonsai. And I, in this case, I also don't want to offend anyone uh, because I have a great appreciation for, for, for them all. And uh, it's the, the main important thing is, in my opinion, to, to share the wisdom about bonsai. And I'm going to show by pictures how they created their style or by who they were uh, influenced. And maybe that they changed their style over time because they uh, had a different approach or a different different view. And I think your styling evolves in in in, in a certain in a certain time or, or a certain way. Also, depending on the tree, sometimes. So bonsai is telling a story about nature, and for everybody, the story is a little bit different. And sometimes a tree will tell the story about where it needs to go to. So after th that time, the school started and I always start with the liner of classic school. And I'm also going to draw a little bit with this. So um, with these liner classic school, you have to think about the image that, I'm, that I show you here. It's a very elegant tree with not a lot of foliage, so very, important with this liner classic school is that it emphasizes the line and you had like a lot of open spaces. So I'm going to draw this as a, a shokal or like an upright tree. It's very elegant and you have a lot of open spaces. Okay. It's not a very big drawing, but it will, it, you will get the idea of it. So on the branches, they were very low in volume and they were, they had perfectly defined uh, profiles. And the dominant line was the height of the tree. And the first branch was quite high and not very low. And they were externally light and they were very graceful trees like in this scroll painting that you're seeing here. So I have a picture of it. So this would if you would have like a, a shokam bonsai or a, a, a fry tree it would be the height would be most important the branches would be quite quite high and you would have a lot of open spaces and then they had time to uh, philosophy or do some philosophy and they started about the volume classical school and this is something you also see a lot that uh, Balbo Stamberger sometimes uses with trees that are quite massive and big, but you still see them around Japan as well. And they emphasize a volume. So that means that you have a lot of foliage and those trunks are mostly very big. And sometimes you also, or people also call them the, the sumo style trees. And the shapes are also very uh, triangular and the branches are quite high in volume and they cover almost the entire trunk. Also, you don't see the back branches very well because the volume is quite, quite high. Um, I have an example, for example, here. So here you can see quite a big trunk. And you see foliar masses, foliage clouds, but you don't see the depth very well because there are not many open spaces. 
and the dominant line was the width, and the first branch was always very low, and the appearance is very heavy and stir sturdy. Sometimes you see these trees, uh, you still see these trees. The picture I'm showing is an example, but it should be a little bit, uh, should be a little bit more than that as well. Also, people, if you have any questions, just ask. Uh, I try, um, for me, it's very nice to be interactive as well. So I want to um, answer as much as questions as possible. You're being very clear so far. Okay, super. Um, then they mixed, they philosophized about it again, and they mixed these two stylings together. And that made the neoclassic school. And uh, this was important because you have the Tasha Gari. And the Tasha Gari is, if you can see here, take the shadow away for a minute. So it's your root base. And the first part of your trunk needs to be visible, like here. Okay. And also the first part of your first branch should, should, should be visible. So if I'm going to draw it, it would be a mix. Of the first tree and the second tree that I have drawn. Okay. And these trees are made of three thirds. And I will show it like this. So the Tashigari is the lowest part of your trunk where your root spread is visible, the first part of the trunk is visible, and the junction of your first branch is visible as well. Okay. They already started to make more triangular uh, volumes in their foliage clouds. And bonsai was made out of three thirds. So if you can see here, one third was the Tashigari. Two thirds, uh, there the trunk was a little bit hidden, but it, there was like a, a picture frame around the most interesting parts. And then three thirds, the trunk should be almost completely hidden. And Yannick, yes. What are the? Is there specific? time periods that these different schools took place? Um, probably there, but I have no idea when, 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 when they happened. Um, the thing sure. is, these, these are things that I always heard like in my, uh, when, I, when I started to, to, to do bonsai, but I have no, um, I have no idea from, from, from when these times happened. So um, I think this was more or less during the war. And I know that Kimura, for instance, but we're going to Masiko Kimura. He's one of the, 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 the most um, or the best bonsai masters that influenced bonsai a lot. And we're going to talk about it later as well. But what he did was he created the rules and, and he influenced it in a way but he started bonsai when he was 15 or something or he started apprenticing when he was 15 years old and i think 20 years later uh, contemporary bonsai started to exist so i'm going to show you this now so this was a con contemporary bonsai school and this was very innovative. And the origin comes from the classic school, but you can break the rules. So it's not that strict. And the founder is more or less Masiko Kimura. And this is because, uh, like I said before, he became an apprentice at the age of 15 on, at Tojuan on the Motosuke Hamano for 11 years. And for him, it was quite an difficult time or difficult um in japan they were how do you say it um, your oyakata is your master and you need to listen and 
if he says something is like this, it is like this, and you cannot say something. You cannot say like it isn't. So if the table, for instance, uh, Taiga one time told us, if Kimura said that the table is black and the table is white, the table is black. And you have to follow this. It's there's no 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 other way. But this used to be in 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 Europe and in America as well with carpenters, uh, bakeries, etc. So when you when you learn the um, how do you call it artistry or artisans uh, kind of thing, uh, the only way to do it was to make a lot of to make a lot of or to work a lot of hours to practice it a lot and. Also, sometimes there were harsh times, and I think it it gets the best out of you. So, so this is this is quite quite important sometimes. Um. So after this, his masterpieces were seen as controversial and different from the traditional work in his first years. This is also because he wanted to he because at an early age his father died. He didn't have the money to, to, to buy fancy, big Yamadori material. So he started to make good bonsai material out of several kinds of things, and he had a lot of good ideas. But also, he started to create shari and deadwood and, and to, to bend roots uh, faster because he had uh, Takeo Kawabe in his, in his uh, garden as an apprentice with him, and he was an engineer. So he came up with the idea to, to, to make certain to make certain tools where they could make dead wood out of it or hollow branches and, 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 and or hollow roots and, and bend these roots to, to make a tree more compact. And then afterwards he became popular for his excellent starkness and uniqueness. And then he started to or be able to to have the money to buy proper material and then he started to become more famous as well and then this con contemporary bonsai art started to to, to flourish and, and, and manifest um and this this was yeah i think when he was the age of 15 it was before or just before the war so i think from then, contemporary art started, and, and before it was during during the war, more or less. Then also, here are some examples of the trees he made. And Kimura is very, uh, very famous for his unique approach, but also for creating very nice volumes. And you see that these volumes are also alternating. Uh, you can see here. Here you have a foliage cloud. I will try maybe to draw on it if that's possible or to mark it. So you have a foliage cloud here. And you have one here, one here, one here. And he's not. Like some, they try to make like a staircase. I always say a staircase to, to, to heaven, but this looks very artificial. And Kimura makes bonsai that looks quite natural, actually. And also with a with a rounded, very beautiful rounded top. And that also shows age, while some style them like more like a triangular shape like this. Here, for example, is his famous... Uh, dragon and the famous forest he made so he was also quite famous about making his his, his forest and, and creations and do something more special so here if you can see it's not this tree is not following the rules and and, and like for example when you had the 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 rules of the tree of the bonsai made in tree thirds also your tashigari is first visible and then afterwards but you have to explain it in your Tashigaro. You have a lot of open spaces with this one here, the classical style. You have a lot of open space here. And uh, when you work your way onto the top, 
your open spaces get smaller, but your foliage clouds get smaller as well. Um, and the foliage clouds are more defined. While in this design, you don't have a lot of open space here. So sometimes you just need to listen to the tree. Uh, what Kimura has done is he made a very beautiful picture frame around the most interesting parts of the tree. Even if you can see here, this part, every movement of this tree, except for maybe this straight part, or maybe that part is not very beautiful. So he put foliage around it so that you can see and, and that it emph emphasizes the line of the tree. Also about this tree is this, I think the light pane, twists around this tree about seven times. So this is a tree that they see in Japan as a very, uh, uh, how do I have to say it, as a very good tree. And this is, this is, by the way, a tree that was very long and he divided the upper, the, the part of the trunk. Uh, he divided it in multiple lines. And then he started to bend the roots around in the pot or, or, or the life vein so that it would become roots. And this tree has never been, it was only repotted once and never and stayed in the spot. Then Why the, hasn't it been repotted? Um, because this was a much bigger tree and he separated the life vein from the rest of the trunk and he coiled up or curled up this root and it's still like this in, 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 in that pot. So maybe because it's very frag fragile in there, but also sometimes trees will stay in a pot for a long time to create mochikomi. Uh, mochikomi is uh, creating age so that your tree and your branches and, and your trunk will start uh, to get age. Because what, what happens when you repot a lot, for instance, with deciduous trees, when you I don't know if someone knows this, but when you repot a tree, and especially the sages, the internodes will get bigger during that time of the repotting. So sometimes you need to think about what's your goal in, 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 in bonsai. And, and for instance, what I mainly do is when I have a cutting and I want to make a big tree, I put them in bigger grains of soil because they need to grow a lot. And because my stage from growing to refinement will not be until the next repotting. So, so because then the internoids can, can be can be bigger because if you have big grains, your roots, your air holes will be bigger and you you need to give a lot more water and a lot more fertilizer. So what happens is that you get a lot of growth, but your internoids will also be a lot longer. And then if your tree gets into a refinement stage, you can put it in smaller grains of soil, and then you also will get uh, smaller internodes. But with every repotting, you cut the roots, and then they start to grow again. The internodes get a little bit bigger as well. So that's something you need to think about as well. As well. And with a tree that stays longer in a pot, the watering will be a little bit more difficult every time, but the tree gets more age and more much gum, as they say. So, and you can see this in the bark and the branches. And this is also quite a, a interesting aspect of bonsai, but not very, very, very easy. Also, you have to give sometimes less water and less uh, fertilizer or fertilizer at a later state to create smaller needles or et cetera. So this is um, sometimes complex. It also depends how much time you have for bonsai, okay? And he's also very famous for making these forest creations. So he made a lot of rock plantings. He made the rocks himself, the slabs himself. Uh, he used to use Ibagawa rocks, but now there are a lot of examples of rocks that he, that he made himself. So it's, it's he tried to make... Uh, he made spectacular things of trees that were not spectacular. And he made very trees that were, were 
and kukufu and trees that not everybody is capable of to make something stunning. And then um, also he had a lot of disciples or apprentices uh, like Taiga Urishibata from uh, Taishuan. And then, of course, in America, Ryan Neal. And then also uh, Marco Invernizzi from Italy, who also uh, works a lot in, in, in America. And we're first going to talk about Taiga Urishibata. So Taiga Urishibata, his father, Nobuishi Urishibata, uh, owned Taishuan. And already they are quite famous about the Shoan trees that they have, but they also have bigger, so they have a little bit of everything. And Taiga already started with bonsai back then, and then he started to do uh, apprenticeship with uh, Masahiko Kimura. And this was not an easy time, but for Taiga, he is already in this in this for for a long time, and his professional journey started when when he started to work for for. Uh, Masahiko Kimura. And that's why he also was influenced by his father first and then afterwards by, by Kimura. And he started to adapt the styling of Kimura, but you still see a little bit of, of traditional Japanese bonsai in, in, in his work. Uh, for instance, with this tree, this is a, a red pine, Japanese red pine. Um, that first was almost two meters or two meters and he's very proud of, about this tree because he banned it un until it was one meter twenty and here you can see that this tree is made out of three thirds so if you have here the tashigari with the first branch here that would be one third then this part will be two thirds and this part will be three thirds so with Ushibata, in my opinion and I don't want to offend Urishibata or Taiga or anyone with this. He still, he, he also does a lot of special things with trees, and I'm going to show it later. But also, he still follows certain traditional rules. But it's allowed to break the rules. So this is a, a tree that also won Prime Minister Award. And is a very famous, or start to become a very famous tree in Japan. What he makes is his foliage clouds he makes like show you <clears throat> he makes them also very dynamic and this is very beautiful but also a dynamic tree so what he does is he makes them like this and this line should be straight and, and also straight with the pot like this so for instance more or less like this, and not like this. And here you see that he does it like this as well, with also alternating Polish clouds, because you have one here, then one at the back, then one here, one here, one here, one here. So this makes the tree very dynamic and starting quite, quite good. Also, the first part of the trunk is very visible. Then the interesting movement is very visible. And then here at the top, everything is hidden, or more or less everything is hidden. And this is this is things that I try to study and try to think about, about how they do these stylings. And then, uh, sometimes the tree tells you what way you need to go to. Here is more or less, this was a tree that he's done after his apprenticeship uh, at Kimura. And this is where he wants to show the artistry that he can. And he wants to make something more special and more out of the box. Normally, you don't see a lot. Of, right? Normally, you don't see a lot that they, especially when it's because this is more like a Saba Miki, Deadwood kind of style and, and also Miyogi kind of style of tree. And he actually made a, Miyogi slash Kangai style of tree. So what a lot of people would maybe do is cut this branch and cut this branch and maybe have the first branch more or less here to create a compact, beautiful tree. What he is doing is he put the tree in a slab and he lets the, the branches 
grow out wider to create a more, much more interesting tree and to create something special. So I think this is also quite important that from the time that you can do the work like your master can do, you start to develop your own style and make certain trees a little bit more special. Um, I think this is an important part for everybody who does who does bonsai. Um, because you have to tell your story. If you want to exhibition a tree, you have to tell your story as well. And I think this makes bonsai more interesting because just because you can you can influence it in your own, own way actually. Here is Taiga while doing a demonstration at the trophy in Belgium. This was on a very big Yamadori Mugu pine. But here you see that he tried, the picture is taken from above, but here you see that he tries to make these foliage clouds into a very uh, natural way. So very dynamic because the tree is very dynamic, but he also has still has some Japanese influences like the open spaces here, here as well. Here are bigger open spaces. And when he works his way to the top, the open spaces are much smaller. Also, here he emphasizes the trunk a lot and he makes a picture frame around the trunk, while here he does more or less the same. So then we have uh, someone else who was an apprentice of uh, Masika Kimura, and that's uh, Ryan Neal. Ryan Neal um, was influenced by Harold Sazaki and after by his master Masika Kimura, where, where he was an apprentice for six or seven years. And of course, in the beginning, or always you have to follow the rules of your master and you have to work like them. But then Ryan Neal started to go to to go back to, 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 to America. And he started to practice or practice what he preaches as American bonsai. And he likes to work a lot with, with, with trees from, from, from the States and that specifically grow there. And he also tries to show his image of nature. And he also wants to play a lot with asymmetry. Uh, he makes balance in other way. For example, Kimura, uh, I get Urshibata, sorry. He creates balance in the composition and uh, in, in the tree, sorry. So that means you have your trunk here, you have your branches here, and your apex is still more or less in the middle of your uh, root flare or your nibari. Here you see the same. It's more or less in the middle and with this one as well. Here you have your nibari, here you have the apex. And he creates balance within the tree. Well, for instance, what Ryan Neal will do a lot is he will create balance and composition. So, for instance, with this one, so for instance, with this tree, here the tree is also in balance, but he sometimes, because this is more or less Bunjing style tree, he uses a little big or slightly bigger pot to create even more balance in this tree. Uh, also, he used a lot of uh, lines to, how do you have to say it? If you draw a line like this, uh, diagonal, that here is a part of life and here is a part of that. So, for instance, with this one, if you see here, this tree is balanced by creating a line between life and death. This is equal to this part. And also there's balance created in the composition by using a bigger pot because this gene is hanging out of the pot. If he would have used a much smaller pot like this, what a lot of people would have done, then you, then the, then the tree looked like the tree would, would, would tilt, tilt over. And this is said. So th this is quite 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 good because he 
it's the word that I'm searching of. Uh, they try to make a symmetry in the tree and also to create balance in, in the composition. And that's why he changed his style a little bit. But you still see some influences that Kimura does as well, like creating those volumes and to create alternating foliage clouds, for instance. Here is one. Here's one in the back. And then here's one. You see a lot with Japanese styling that from the first branch that's divided in three foliage clouds. So this is the first one, then this one. And then this one, because you, what you need to do is when you style a bonsai tree and you have your trunk, first your trunk needs to be in the right position. And we try to, or we need to compact the tree. But what always has happened is, what always will happen is that this trunk line here will be copied. You will always, always see this. And it's copied because of, or you can copy it with the movement of this branch going like this. But with this one, because probably of the nature of the branch, it would only be possible like this. But then you could create a branch or a foliage cloud here. So it closes this space, because otherwise here will be too much open space. And for instance, with this tree, he again has a diagonal line. To create balance, and he uses a bigger pot as well. And while maybe like Kimura Taiga would create a tree that's balanced in the tree itself. So they what they would do is they would maybe change the angle of this tree and create the apex above uh, the Nibari. And then how do you have to say it? Then they would with this branch, they would bend it more low to create a branch like here to close that open space. So this is quite interesting what, what Ryan Neal does. And he tries to use a lot of asymmetry as well. Together with this design as well, this is a Colorado spruce, if I'm correct. Sorry if I'm wrong. But here he chooses a piece of deadwood to be the pot. And he makes, here you see to have this diagonal line again, and he makes, that's the small one. And he makes balance into the composition by using a very big piece of log, or how do you call it? And to tilt the tree a lot to the, to, to, to the left, or to the right. So he tries to create a very, or a more dynamic tree. To tilt it a little bit more, and to create uh, balance into, into the composition. This is something what actually Kunio Kobayashi, and my master, has done a lot as well. But this is a topic that I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit later. Uh, yes, it's, I think it's because not a lot of people think about these things, but I think sometimes you need to think a little bit deeper. And maybe it's my own perception of it. I don't know. Maybe I'm I'm, I'm wrong and maybe Ryan or Taiga or they want to do it a little, they wanted to tell something different, but that's the same with, with art as well. Uh, if you have an artist who makes a painting, they want to tell a story, but Everybody will have a, another uh, interperception, or how do I have to say? Or another perception. So these are things where where I think of. And, 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 um, for instance, what I mainly try to do when I style a oak tree is I look at the tree because for uh, I look at the tree and the tree tells me what I, I need to do. Uh, and that's for a lot of bonsai masters uh, because wine can, can, can shape a, a typical bonsai, a Japanese bonsai style. Tiger can do it, but sometimes you have to do something different. And the, the tree will tell you where you, where, you, where, you, where you will go, actually. Next one in Japan is Kunio Kobayashi. 
this was my uh, Oyakata. And while his parents had a flower nursery, Tobias, he started doing bonsai uh, at, at his late 20s. So, and he was self-taught. So after 40 years of doing bonsai, and he already was quite well known because the fun fact is he actually was a gymnast and he was a very uh, famous gymnast in, in Japan. I don't know if you know the, the thing with the courts, but uh, I don't know what it's called to hang. The, the, the rings. One, uh, the rings, yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, before Bonza, he, he did that. So, and then he started uh, with Satsuki uh, Bonsai because Satsuki was quite famous in Bonsai and, and because there was a lot of profit into this. Um, and then he started to go over to Japanese black pines and, and etc. And he was self-taught, so he he teached himself a lot about bonsai. And but he already had, because of his parents, because he had a flower nursery, already a basis of how to care for trees, etc. And then after forty years of, of doing bonsai, he changed his style from creating beautiful clean trees. To what he calls Agino Agro Bonsai. And with this, he wants to explain or he wants to mimic the harshness of nature in his trees. So, for instance, this is the Satsuki Bonsai, but Satsuki Bonsai is very difficult to create in a very natural way because then you need to create a, bo a bush. Um, and there is a style of developing where some trees that are created like bushes. And they can be like in a single tokonoma with that tree, will will be very special, created in, in that way. But this is not not the good example. I, I will maybe show later if that's possible. But in his other uh, examples, this is more clear. So these two junipers are the same one, and this one even before at the start of his career was a very clean style and here it's starting to look more natural but he even developed the tree in a way like here now i think this is maybe two three years ago so he wants to create a tree that looks like a tree in nature and and uh, that had a lot of weather conditions and that met the harshness of, of, of nature like especially as uh, also with, with this one here. Here you also see that it are not very clean, um, static, uh, static lines into the tree and it's also very dynamic. And he tries to make the tree more natural. It's also very different from, from traditional Japanese style. But very interesting in, in, in my opinion. For instance, when, when I was there, I think that's 12 years ago, he has a lot of Chinese customers. So we also did a lot of Chinese styling. Um, and he was telling about that, like <clears throat> Chinese styling is always with a, with a longer branch on the tree. So uh, because they, they, they like this, it's, 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 and he had a lot of customers. So from a commercial aspect, he made it into Chinese styling, but also because he told me uh, he leaves sometimes branches on for customer to buy and they can cut the branch because then they say like, oh, we, we changed the tree from Kobayashi. So also from a commercial aspect. So that was quite interesting as well. Then we have uh, an apprentice of Kobayashi who is Minoru Akiyama. Um, I think he works a lot in the States as well. Um, and Minoru Akiyama was influenced by his father and by Kunio Kobayashi. As he is now the second generation of bonsai professional in the Yamanashi uh, prefecture. And he apprenticed for six years at Kunio Kobayashi. And uh, Minoru Akiyama is very known for his refined work and his knowledge about many species. I visited his garden and they had like a lot of pagos, a lot of junipers, satsuki, 
uh, Punis Ume is also quite known for grafting certain species that are quite difficult in Japan, like Ume. And when you have the knowledge about doing that or grafting in a good way. Uh, okay, so Jennifer Williams says, very interesting to see the difference in each artist style. Thank you for pointing this out. Hard to unsee this once it's pointed out. Yes, maybe that's not a good thing for me to do because then you start to notice things. But on the other hand, uh, it's good for people to think about certain things in Bonza. Uh, this is also interesting to develop other styles or other schools. And I think this, this would be interesting. So, for instance, Akiyama is very influenced by his father and by Kunio Kobayashi. And yet, though, he stayed with having clean trees or styling clean trees. Also, because in Japan, you have certain preferences. If you see Kokofu during the years, you see these bonsai also develop. If you see the Kokofu books. And you see that there are sometimes changes, like sometimes they paint the dead wood white and sometimes they leave it the natural color or sometimes they start to remove the bark from the live paint and sometimes they kept the the bark on to create it more natural so it also depends what's what's famous or what's a hype at that time for instance here uh this is also a very famous tree of uh, akiyama san here you can see that he also creates volumes um <clears throat> And that he is very, uh, how do you want to say, very refined, that he has very refined work. Um, this is more triangular, so less rounded than Kimura would do, but Kimura is also not his master. Well, here you see that he creates a bit more rounded apex in here as well. Also, you see that here you don't see the branches go up so much and here you see this and this is also here, here you see the branches go up a lot and this is also what we're going to talk about a little bit later because it also depends what view of bonsai if you have a bird's eye view if you're standing in front of the trunk or if from frog view so if the tree is very close um, and I think that sometimes, and this is what Tunis Jan uh, Klein, uh, a Dutch bonsai professional, told me. So this is sometimes also a story of what a certain artist wants to tell. If the tree is close or if you're standing up on a mountain hill and you see the tree going, you see the tree very low, things like this. But here also you see that uh, this is, I think, Akiyama-san told me that these trees were Yamadori that his father collected. They are quite valuable now. And as you can see, these Polish clouds are quite very refined, very well refined with a lot of ramification inside of it here as well. This is a little bit more natural. So sometimes he also makes a tree very natural depending on how you evolve a bonsai as well. Then we have another uh, apprentice of Kunio Kobayashi, and that's someone you all know as well, probably Peter Warren. He's here. And Peter Warren is actually uh, the reason well, the reason why I apprenticed that at Kunio Kobayashi's place at uh, Shunkan. And he introduced me to Kunio Kobayashi, and then I started to, to, to work for him. So, uh, while soccer or football brought Peter Warren to Japan, he finished uh, after six year apprenticeship at Kobayashi. So his only influence, because before he went to Japan, he didn't do bonsai. So his only influence of bonsai was Kobayashi at that time. Also, for he he gave English classes at the school, and. Uh, then he started to visit uh, Shunkan, and then he started to become uh, an apprentice there as well. So, and Peter Warren is some someone who is also very inspired by nature and also likes to mix contemporary art 
with his bonsai sometimes. He in London he made a exhibition to mix um, bonsai with contemporary art, and this uh, you can see this online. Uh, this ex exhibition was called Natural Flowers. I visited and it was quite interesting because uh, different kinds of ceramics were uh, were used, and different kinds of displaying tables, and it was quite interesting to see. But it all suited quite quite well, actually. And the thing is, uh, I have a lot of respect for Peter Warren because he's a guy with a lot of knowledge. He really knows a lot, and, and I, a lot. He doesn't show his work that much, but his work for refinement is also very good. But he also wants to wants to make more natural kind of designs, and here are a few trees of him. This is a rosemary which is quite in the Japanese and this is not an easy species in Europe. So this is the Yamadori rosemary and it's not an easy species. So to maintain this kind of Japanese design into this tree is it's not, not, not easy. Uh, so this is more like a Japanese style tree. Here you have a European Yamadori spruce. Um, this is still like a Japanese kind of uh, design and here you have a Scots pine uh, this is like a more a natural design where he makes like one two three apexes you have this trunk line with this trunk line following that line and the branches are not very well uh, how do we have to see the branches are styled in a very nat nat natural way, so the tree doesn't need to be clean. And, 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 and. this gives a, a different feeling in, in bonsai. And it's not very easy to, to, to do this, especially not when you're used to making clean trees. Yannick, what's the size of that rosemary tree? About how tall is it? Um, if I see the display, I if I see the 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 turning table, I might guess fifty, sixty centimeters. I think it's quite, quite, quite a big tree. Mm. Big, but I think like something like fifty, sixty centimeter, maybe forty, but I think something around fifty or sixty centimeters. With the with the tangent, so with this. So for a couple of a couple of feet for Americans here, Sorry? how do you do conversion from meters to feet? Ah, uh, is is it like two two feet? About two feet, yeah. Something like that, yeah. Two two feet. Then we have Keiichi Fujikawa, and uh, Mr. Fujikawa is the second generation owner owner of Fujikawa Kaukan Nursery. Yannick. Can we yeah. pop back to the other one? Yes, of course. Uh, the question is, is the dead wood on the rosemary part of the live tree or is it a tanuki? Uh, no, this is a Yamadori that comes, I think, from South France or Spain. And it's not a tanuki. I also think it's not easy to make tanuki out of rosemary. So uh, this is completely a natural tree. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt you. No, 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 no problem. You can interrupt me whenever you want. So, um, this is also a tree that I think was first from Lorenzo Agnoletti, uh, if I'm not mistaken, and then Peter Warren bought it from him, um, and made his creation out of it. Where the tree went now, I have no idea. But for this piece, it's quite quite a beautiful one. I know uh, when I worked for Joe Paul Polmans uh, in Belgium, he also was a very good Yamadori collector. And in the south of France, we have seen rosemaries like like with coiled, very beautiful trunks and with like trunks like this big. So it was quite quite special. What type of tree is the one in the middle? Uh, the this tree is a spruce. Uh, so as we say in Europe, uh, Picea. Um, it's it's spruce and 
in the States, I think, no? So, and this is like a Yamadori, Yamadori tree, maybe collected in France or Austria or Switzerland, I have no idea. In some places in Europe, they don't really look, um, or they are not very strict about collecting because they still don't have a lot of knowledge about it. For instance, in Spain, they have. So there were some examples of uh, cars that have been confiscated and because they found or see a car or they, they stopped the car and it was full of uh, Sabina junipers and they didn't have a permit. So while in France, you can just collect them, they don't really care about it. So and France and Spain are not that far from each other. So it's a little bit strange. Maybe it's a it's a, a, a issue of, of of the land itself or how the people think. I don't know. Uh, so, uh, Keiichi Fujikawa, Mr. Fujikawa is the second generation owner of Fujikawa Kaukan Nursery and is one of the most respected bonsai nursery men in the Kansai area of Japan. He spent several years as an apprentice under Saburo Kato at Monsean in Omiya and has since devoted himself to the progression and development of bonsai art, both within Japan and abroad. So this is the Oyakata or bonsai master of Bjorn Bjorn. Uh, and this is also a man who is known for his uh, very refined work, very... Uh, how do I have to say it? His technique is done very properly, very securely. But you, you can also see in this work because uh, Bjorn used to do this as well, but he changed the style a little bit. So you can see it, see it here, and here we see Bjorn as well. But he creates very straight lines in his foliage clouds. Instead of creating them like this. For me, this has more like a, gives the tree. When you have a tree with, with this movement, it creates it. It looks more static. While if you create pads that are more rounded from the downside, uh, it will look more dynamic. And with this tree, you see the same. They are quite straight here as well, quite straight, but very well refined, very, uh, the technique is done very properly. So Bjorn had to follow his master's work. Na Naoki Maoki, and he studied art and graduated graphic design, and he only apprenticed with Fujikawa. And he, when you see his design, you can see that he kept um, or has a lot of respect for what his master does and creates this in his trees as well. So if you can see here, he didn't change his style over the time. And I, I think he still doesn't do it. So he still is using a very... Uh, refined but also very done very a technique that is done very properly so he creates these straight lines in these foliage clouds as well so the technique is done very properly and you see with all their Francis who goes to Kaukan uh, that they do this as well here as well very straight in the design but this is the story that Fujikawa wants to tell about the trees. And these trees are very properly done. So in my opinion, it's his story he wants to tell. So there's nothing wrong with this. I, want, I also want to explain that in bonsai, if the technique is done properly, there is no wrong or right. There are certain people who try to explain that this should be the way in bonsai. In my opinion, 
every way it could be possible. Then you have Bjorn Bjorn. Everybody knows him. Uh, very great guy. Very good in his styling. Uh, also a good friend of mine. And like uh, Dodi told before, in October we will have like a bonsai styling mashup. So I'm looking forward to that as well. So Bjorn Bjorn is very, uh, very known and all around the world. Um, he started bonsai at a young age, and I think he started bonsai together with his father, and they also um, had the, the, the Knoxville Bonsai Club, or Knoxville Bonsai Association, or if, I don't know how you call them, or they started or, or, or started this. And after that, he started to apprentice under Fujikawa. And here you already see Bjorn still at his still young stages. He's still young, but it, this is some time ago in Japan. And here you see that he created these trade lines as well, because he had to follow the rules of his master. But very interesting design, very beautiful design. Also, here you see that, uh, how do you have to say? A lot of things get, get copied, like this resembles with this part and also with the apex. So, but also the use of a lot of foliage clouds or foliage clouds indeed, and also to create alter alternating clouds as well into the design and creating volumes. This is something they, they all do in Japan or most, most, most people do. Then here, the young Bjorn again following the lines that his master does. And then here Bjorn back in the States, creating more dynamical foliage clouds. So here you can see he's starting to fall. This is like traditional style where you see the Tashigar with the first branch and this is visible. Then the second part, the trunks. A little bit hidden and then here completely hidden but the foliage clouds already start to become less straight and more dynamic here as well I will draw it so here you can see like this here as well also in the design of Fujikawa you see that the ramification is not visible and here you can see that we were also Changed into this design. So now he's back in Japan, and I wonder how this will influence his work as well. So for me, that's quite interesting to follow because over time, people start to change and, and, and you start to also, you will start to work with different trees. And I think this, this is a very interesting challenge for Bjorn. Uh, first went to Japan, working on these well-refined trees and setting them and then refining them even, even better and better. Then go back to the States to work on very good quality Yamadori and to setting the bones again and to make trees better. And now he's going to back to Japan to, to, to so it's, it's, I do have to say that it's, it's very interesting. Uh, uh, oh, the situation is very interesting because uh, he has to change again, and it's 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 it goes out of the boundaries. So this is quite quite interesting. If I'm explaining well, okay. Then here story of the perception and a view, and this was what I already talked about about what Tunis Jan Klein told me and about how foliage clouds are made. So while well, this tree here, here you see the branches coming or sticking out a lot. So this could be that the, that the artists want to explain that this tree you see very close and the tree is above you and you see the branches. And you can look into the branches so that it has a vision of you looking at the frog perspective 
up to the tree. While here you don't see these branches and you just see foliage. So here you could say that maybe from a bird's eye view, you can see above the tree so that you're standing up a hill. So I think this is something the Tunis Elder client told me and I thought this would, would be interesting to, to, to talk about as well. And with every exhibition or every toponomic, uh, um, you have to tell a story. So you have to create the flow into the tree. So the flow of this tree goes to here. You have to have the right display table. You have to have a beautiful old accent plant that comes from the same place as where your tree comes from. Maybe with a scroll. All these kinds of things. So you have to tell your story about this or your own tree action. Then I have a little piece of bonsai in Europe. I think everybody knows Mario Komsta. Mario Komsta is uh, originally from Poland and he went to start to be an apprentice of Nobushi Urushibata of Taishuan, the father of Taiga Urushibata. Then Danius. Danius is one of the people in Belgium who has influenced bonsai in Europe a lot. Uh, but I think he started with importing trees. And when he started to go to Japan, bonsai in Europe started to become more popular, but also the level started to become higher. And um, he was influenced by, I don't know which Japanese people, but I think from Mansien. Um, and uh, but he started importing and having the Ginkgo Awards, bonsai started to, to uplift in, in Europe as well. And then we have Walter Paul. Walter Paul is very known about his natural style and his hedge cutting techniques. So I want to talk about that as well. So let's start with Mario Komsta. He completed a five year apprenticeship in Taishuan nursery under uh, Nobushi Oshibata and received a certificate of skill in bonsai. He is recognized professional by Nippon Bonsai Association and All Japan Shoin Bonsai Association. So Mario Komsta is a guy with a lot of knowledge who has a very good technique, uh, makes very well refined trees and also the sages trees. And his, uh, I think his skills are quite, quite mind blowing. And lately he started to think a lot about uh, not really thinking, of, it's, it's like thinking out of the box, but he wants to create special kind of trees to do something special with it uh, and like this is a very spectacular uh, scotch pine very well designed very good so and while this is still like a more classical design he tries to do with other trees special things and uh, these are trees that are that i'm not now going to show you that are um, not very special when they were not styled yet but if you look at these trees about how they are styled and if you look at nature in our place these are trees that you can find like that over here so there's the technique is done very properly and it made the tree more unique and more special uh, this is not an imported tree. This is a Scotch pine Yamadori. Uh, I think this tree was once collected by my old bonsai master, Jean-Paul Polmans. And I think he sold it to someone in Spain. And Mario Comsta styled this from raw material. So I think here was foliage as well. And he bended the trunk or this part of the trunk. And he created this tree with branches but where the foliage was quite far away and he created a very uh, compact and beautiful scots pine out of it so uh, to create this uh, quite good and also in, in relatively a short time he created this so marco says his, his technique is really really stunning and uh, i think at the moment he's one of the the best in in, in europe 
his his knowledge, his work, his technique is is mind blowing. <laughs> and especially with this tree as well. This is a skull spine, but this is the first styling of this tree. And if you see the detail and, and, and how every branch is placed and how nice everything is done. And this is a tree that I could see here in my in the forest here of a skull spine that, that, that looks like this. Uh, how did he shorten and compact it? Did he graft it? Uh, no, I don't think he grafted. it. Uh, I think he banded the trunk, he banded some branches and created uh, back budding in this tree. So his skills about bonsai are, are quite good. Uh, there's a article, I think, about this tree somewhere. I think bonsai focus or bonsai art, maybe. I'm not sure. But I don't think this one was rough. So here, this one as well. As you can see, uh, I've tried to show with these ones. I So with here, I showed a very spectacular tree. And these trees are quite simple, but they're very elegant. And the way he made these trees, it's quite, in my opinion, quite unique because he made out of something not so special, he made a very special tree with some details that you might think, oh, this this is not how it should during the Bondi rules, but it's thinking outside of the box. Like this branch starts here and goes like this. And the Bondi rules that would this would be would be a no-go, and some people would think oh, we would cut this branch. But then you have a 12 and a dozen tree. For instance, here as well. Yeah. Oh, where's my mouse? Here we have this branch going like here, and this one is crossing with this one. But this replicates a tree that you can see in nature. And the styling of these trees are that complex that not, not everybody understands how, how do I have to say it? Not everybody understands this kind of work especially with the ones that I'm going to show now, this one. This is a tree that a lot of people might think that maybe it is not completely finished, but the work on this tree is done that properly, that it, and it's also complex because here the trunks are crossing, and it's it just works, in my opinion. I don't know what everything finds about things about it, but if you can see it, it's a very natural, fine style. It's a tree that that's here that we could see as well, and I think that's also another perception in bonsai that's quite interesting. Well, here again you have a more Japanese tree where you can see the ramification going up, and you can see the volumes into the tree, so. Sometimes the tree will tell you to go full Japanese on it, or full Japanese is only a perception, actually. And sometimes you have to create your own thing and make something special out of it. And I think the tree will tell you where you need to go. Then here, this is Danny Use. Uh, I think. I don't know if a lot of people in the States know him as well, um, but he's one of the one of the people who uplifted Bonsai in Europe. So his parents already had a tree nursery, and at the age of 17, Danny started his Bonsai nursery. And when he traveled to Japan as a buying trip, Bonsai in Europe started to boom with great thanks to Danny, who made also who also made the Ginkgo Award happen. And this is Danny started to do a lot of chat, had a lot of Japanese influences in his design or used to have. And now he started to do his own thing and also to create natural bonsai. Uh, for example, this is a well known tree of Danny, and this is a Shishigashira. 
Uh, this one he created all by himself as well, but he created into a very natural tree by not doing too much on it. Just let it grow and sometimes to pinch where necessary. So with this tree, not much work was done and it's one of his, it's, it's, if you see the tree in real life, it's quite a big tree as well. The picture doesn't do it justice. Uh, but it's quite a spectacular tree as well. And uh, here's a white pine wood from Danny. And here you can see that he was influenced by a lot of Japanese influences as well. But for instance, this one used to be more cleanly styled. And now he changes his way into a little bit more natural. So this is quite interesting in my opinion as well. Also, this one, this is from a student of his. And these trees were, this tree was wired a couple of times. And also, Danny, what Danny does is he created a lot of uh, material uh, and grown these material in fields. So he could uh, sell them um, and people could create bonsai out of it. This is one of these. Uh, this is one of these junipers and they were wired a couple of times but afterwards they were just cut and that's how we created this upper growth to see this ramification and this is the, the certain Japanese styling where it was influenced by but also because he wants to try he wants to create a more natural styling as well also lately with this uh, deciduous trees he styles them in a way that it looks more natural. So more branches that are flowing, more branches that are growing into the light and not create more um, foliage clouds into a deciduous tree. So this is also quite interesting. He has a, I think he has a very big uh, bonsai nursery with a lot of material. If you ever find a chance to visit them, I think it's very interesting because he has a beautiful garden but he has several gardens and also he starts to use like like what's what's he called uh, he's, he creates bonsai also out of bushes but he creates a style that's certain kind of a bushy style but if you have this tree in a tokonoma it will be a very nice solitaire while if you see it with a lot of other magnificent bonsai then, then you would think like this tree doesn't doesn't look like anything with all these amazing pieces. But if you present it in the right way, with the right scroll and with only with with that bush kind of styling, I, I explained it a little bit in a not so decent way. Um, but it's very interesting. It's something you could ask Danny to give a presentation about it, it will be very interesting. He also talks with a lot of passion. And uh, yes, yeah, very interesting. Then we have Walter Paul. Uh, Walter Paul took up bonsai as a hobby in, in the 1980s. And in 1990, he left his job to become, become a part-time bonsai professional. Paul is particularly known for his workshops and lectures, which he gives at conventions around the world. He also visited the States or America quite a lot, so I think he's well known. Uh, he's also very known about his naturalistic style and his hatch cutting method. So he clips with his scissors like a hatch to create ramification. And this is actually a technique that they also do in Japan. Um, if you see at IGN, they have trees with a lot of ramification and they also clip some of the, the tridents just like this and follow the shape to create air and light into the tree and then you get a lot of ramification short ramification as well so short internodes but you also get a lot of crossing branches but this is something that you can that you get a winter you can you can you can cut and you can change and also thicknesses and branches and stuff like that Here are a few designs of Walter Prowl. So if you can see here, this is a spruce Yamadori. He makes a lot of trees or he 
repots a lot of trees and slabs to make a very natural composition. And he doesn't, while Walter Powell has done or made, used to make traditional Japanese bonsai, he changed his style again to a more natural feeling to create a more natural tree. Also with his deciduous trees, here you don't see any foliage clouds, you see branches crossing through each other and to and he creates a very natural style. And then with the hatch clipping technique, he creates a lot of ramification in these trees. And the next one here, also one of his earlier spruces also uh, repotted in an iron, iron slab or an iron, uh, iron stone pot. Uh, this is a pot that's that you can find in the somewhere in Germany and in, in, in the ground. And also these branches are like mm, not super clean and very natural. So. Yannick, there's a question. Is hedge cutting yeah. method only used on deciduous? Uh, yes, hedge cutting method is only used on deciduous. So when you have a tree that has this outer line they follow the outer line and they cut they cut they cut they cut the new growth so especially when when your growth is it's how do you have to explain sometimes with trees you have like uh very strong growth then you have mediocre growth or middle growth or how do you have to explain it you have weak growth and when you fertilize in a correct way and give water in a correct way, it's possible that you create a balance into the entire tree. And what you can do is you can just cut in the shape of the tree to create more small ramification and internoids. Um, and only with the CG trees, edge cutting technique is, is done. I think with uh, conifers and stuff like that is quite difficult to do and it's not so healthy so uh, not so healthy for the tree so then bonsai in america uh, because i already talked about ryan neal and bjorn bjorn uh, there are still uh, several others uh, but also i didn't want to go out too much in this topic um, but i also wanted to talk about john naka because he was also one of the people who who made Bonzo in America famous as well, I think. And uh, I could have talked about a lot of other people as well, like Matt Real or Tyler Sherrod, or uh, for example, Michael Hagedorn, who is uh, apprentice of uh, Shinji Suzuki, and who also has a very beautiful uh, styling and, and, and influence Bonzo in America quite, quite, quite well as well. So Jean Joshua Naka is the most influential bonsai master in in the American uh, bonsai industry, especially from the 1950s to the 1960s. He was one of the first bonsai masters to teach bonsai in a non-Japanese language, making learning the art form of bonsai easier and more convenient for non-Japanese aspiring artists. So from what I heard is that he went to America to start a Japanese garden company, more or less. And then he also started to teach bonsai as well. Then this is John Naka with Goshen. This is one of his most uh, famous trees. And he was also fond of using American species or species that grow well in America for bonsai. So here you see why the traditional styling of of Jap what looks like or what looks like ja Japanese bonsai. And he was also famous about his drawings that are quite famous as well. So here, this is also quite uh, a traditionally styled bonsai. With here, your first branch, uh, counterbalance, next one, next one, next one, back bran branches and stuff like that. Here's one of his drawings where he created a forest and created very fine ramification on this forest. So 
than bonsai in China. I'm going to talk a little bit about this, but I already talked a little about it. So in China, they started with Panjing and these are more landscapes, landscape kind of, or trees mixed in uh, landscape with rocks and stuff like that. And they use more figurines and also what they use is longer branches. So if you can see here, with, if it, this would be a Japanese tree, this part would probably be cut. This one would bend down closer to the trunk to create a more balanced tree. Uh, so in China, they try to elongate the branches a little bit more. Also with this juniper over here, here you see it's very long. Like if this would be a Japanese tree, this maybe would be cut. And this would be brought in here to create an apex here and maybe for the branch here to create more balance into this. Here as well. Also, bonsai in China is bigger. So also when they when they ex exhibit a tree, um, the tables are bigger. The tables are not that clean. The pots are not that clean, maybe some cracks or some things are in the pots. For them, it's about a tree. And the trees sometimes are very big, like bigger than than the artist itself, like, like in this pictures. Uh, and here you can see that they are also creating very long branches. It's typical Chinese styling. Also, when they exhibit the branch. The pots are not clean, the tables are not clean, so they, they use what they got and they want to emphasize the tree. So this is very interesting aspect as well. Also, the, the showen are quite bigger. Though. So sometimes you, you see an image that looks like a showen display and a, and a wooden frame with multiple showen trees, but the trees are like this side. Very interesting. Then bonsai in Taiwan. Um, we are almost uh, finished because we can talk about like bonsai in Indonesia and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, etc. Uh, but bonsai in Taiwan for me is also very interesting because they create very special junipers and also very special chromatic trees with very good refinement. And this refinement they do with a lot of cutting. And for instance, you all know Julian Tsai. He tries to use, or he uses now the technique also of letting the branch grow, cutting it back when it has the right size, then wire the branch again to create movement into the branch, letting it grow, cutting back again to get more uh, branches from that as well because they split into two, then wire again, let it grow out when it has the, the decent or the correct size. And then to create ramification. So this takes much longer, but you can create very beautiful ramification, very beautiful branches with a lot of beautiful movement into it. This is quite a famous tree, and um, I think Min Yuan Lo, if I'm correct, I'm not sure. And then also they create a lot of spectacular junipers. Uh, also in Taiwan, the trees are quite big and quite massive as well, and bigger than the normal maximum 1.20 meters. So if you most of these junipers are grown in full in, in full ground, and they have created trees that are very spectacular with very spectacular dead wood, very beautiful volumes into these trees and very natural as well. I really, I really like them. And I think I'm now going to talk about the last topic. I think uh, you had this year or last year, Laurent Darieux, and he is in, he was influenced by Japanese bonsai, later on with bonsai in, in Taiwan, and he studied in Taiwan as well. If I, if I write, or correct, uh, he started to develop cosmic bonsai. And uh, while there is a lot of uh, controversy about this topic, especially since the late uh, trophy, 
I think the technique that he uses to create his trees is very good. If you can do this with trees, then you know and understand how trees work. Uh, he thinks just out of the box. And for me, it would be interesting to have him one time over at my place to create a tree like this, because I would like to have one tree like this in my in my collection. So Cosme Bonsai is a founder of Laurent Darieu from France. And I think he was influenced by Japanese bonsai, Taiwanese bonsai, and made his own perception and art by letting the tree grow. Use scarification in the tree and not cutting the tips until the tree had a shape. The people correct me if I'm wrong. So here's an image of uh, a drawing he makes. So what he does is he creates spectacular movements in these trees. Um, and then creates, when the tree has the desired size, then he starts to cut them and create ramifications. Also with this one, I've seen this at the trophy and also in another one. Um, the technique in these trees are done very properly and very, very good. Then I have a lot of respect for this. Um, and I would like to have and there's a, one tree like this in, in my collection as well, just to have something different. And this is the uh, whole new. Um, this was the PowerPoint so far. Uh, and talking about Bonsai styling a unique approach and frequency on how time countries and school influence Bonsai around the world. So maybe you guys have some questions, and I'm open to answer every question that you want, if it's about bonsai. Yannick, your, your points were very well taken. You um, enlightened me on, on things to look at. I, I, mm -hmm. It was very, very good. But we do have a question here. Can you please explain scarification? Yeah. Yes, uh, with scarification, Laurent Darieux means uh, to create charis in the trunk. So what he does is uh, he creates and and like they also make do this in Japan to create very interesting shari and bonsai. So what he does is he let the trunk grow first, then he creates a small piece of shari. Then he lets the let the wound heal over, so the cambium will heal and make it a little bit bigger. Then he follows that line again, and he cuts, he he cuts and follow that line again into the same shape, but makes it a little bit bigger. And then you create uh, depth into the dead wood, uh, and create more textures into this dead wood. So that's that's what I mean with 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 scar scarification. Ah, you would love to see some work of mine. Um, I can try to. There was a question is, what is your own take on styling bonsai, given that you've educated us on the history and the various stylings? Um, wait, wait a second. I'm going, I'm. Yeah, I. Mm. Okay, now I can now I can see again. So I will first uh, show people some of my styles. Um, this here is a, a Larix Shamadori that I styled for the last three or four years, maybe five. For instance, it's this tree. And it first looked like this. This was a tree that a customer uh, that a customer bought somewhere else, and he first styled with a different bonsai master. And here was a big knob. I thought you could make the tree more interesting to use the the back side as the front side. So this was the first styling to create a more fluent, fluently movement 
and to create better and more beautiful ramification with branches that are hanging down. And here is the tree the year after. I think it was uh, 12 weeks ago. So this is a large I designed. This is a U I designed. It first looked like this. This was a styling by Mathieu Merouille. And I did a refinement stage of this tree. Then <clears throat> this is a Yamadori Scott Spine that I styled. Uh, I made the tree more compact, so I bend it in this part. I first did the deadwood with Andres Bicocca to create a more beautiful deadwood. He's a very specialist. He's very specialist about creating deadwood and sandblasting it and creating it with manual tools. Then I started to bend this part to make the tree more compact. And then I uh, designed three apexes on the street to create more special and not like a traditional style of bonsai. And this part I made like this because this was a very straight line and to hide that very straight line. This one to close this open space so that we only have a little open space here and, and here a little bit and to create an interesting compact tree. And later on, the tree was repotted in its first pot uh, seven weeks ago. Uh, this, thank you. This is an olive that I started from raw material in November 2019. I started to cut the branches. And this was one week ago. So um, then this is one of my scold spines that I collected myself in France. Um, when I collected the tree, it looked like that. I put this one in a, in a mixture of rooting and cutting soil together with pumice. To, I noticed that here the trees grow well in rooting and cutting soil because of the perlite, they make a lot of new, new roots. And if you add it to pumice, it makes it more aerial. Uh, then the tree was first repotted. And then I started on creating back budding on the tree. So afterwards, we could make the first design. The first design was made together with Manuel Calmade. And now for the last three, four years, tree starting to look like this. Uh, then this one I recently styled. Um, <clears throat> this tree was quite a famous tree in Japan that started to lose some branches and I could get hold on it and I made the tree strong again. Um, then I went to visit uh, America uh, and Robert Pressler took me to uh, took me to visit uh, the cypresses, so to visit uh, the the lone cypress, and I was um, I was very how do I have to say it? I fell in love with these Monterey cy cypresses. So and because juniper and cypress are quite related, um, I then had an idea how to style this tree because there were not many branches left. I've cut this one, and with this one, I created the first branch, and then with this one, let some foliage grow out, and create another another tree out of it, and then I created this out of, out of it. I first created the tree one year ago, and last week, um, I started to uh, clean the tree again, and we potted it on this Ibogara rock to create a very natural design and to create an, an, a note to my trip to, to America uh, because there the ID came from. So uh, it, it That is stunning. We have a couple questions about it. Um, yeah. How did you make this tree strong again? Um, so I when a tree is weak, I take the tree out of the pot and I 
put it in a bigger pot with only pumice uh, and with big grains of pumice because that's very aerial and then the tree because they are weak and they don't take a lot of water and because pumice uh, drainage is quite well they start to dry out what's better for the tree and they can start to grow in it again also because pumice is quite porous the, uh, the roots start to split and they make more feeder roots um, and then I also use uh, fish mix or uh, fish emulsion if, if, if I say if I can, can say, say like this and then when you start to get healthy growth shoots like this or shoots like this then the tree is healthy to to work on and then i i could start to, to work on it so uh that's a technique that i sometimes use sometimes i see sick trees at other nurseries and i buy them for a cheap price put them in a bigger pot filled with pumice and then they start to regain uh, health again and then you can start to work on that so this is quite quite good sometimes um then there was a question what's your own take on styling bonsai uh so what's my own take on styling bonsai i've been influenced by a lot of bonsai teachers around the bonsai world as we talked about a little earlier because i started with shoppo pullmans um i also worked a little bit for danny Hughes uh, when i was young then i had classes with otsumi tarakawa uh Mario Komsta, Manuel Kamade, uh, then Punyu Kobayashi, etc. Uh, for me, it's very important to learn a lot of aspects from everyone and to create my own thing with it. Um, so I mostly have an idea what I will do with the tree, but the tree tells it to me. So if the design would suit that it look, looks more natural, I will try to make it more natural itself. Um, but with a lot of trees, I make like also very clean, strict, very clean, dramatic design. And that's something what I like. Also with this one that I showed before, uh, the juniper is also quite dramatical, but also quite natural. And with this, uh, it's called Spina that I collected myself. It's very dramatical, but it's very clean style and it's not very natural you know so but it's also a tree with a lot of movement and i think like a natural styling i think that the, the feeling of, of of the tree goes goes away uh, so i try to do several kinds kinds of thin things i also make bonsai more traditional sometimes it depends how the tree looks with this one, this was my demo demonstration tree for the trophy. Here I created more volumes. So so it really depends. Um, one of the I, questions was, what's your basic soil mix? Uh, my basic soil mix is I. What I try to do is I. I try to make bonsai as uh, as simple as possible, because bonsai. How oh, do I have to explain? People they have they have work. Or most people have work. Uh, the everyday ha uh, hustle is not always easy, and I think we need to make bonsai more understandable for people and not use too much difficult words. And so people can understand it. Also, I try to make things more easy. For instance, I, I designed fertilizer and tea bags that a machine makes so people don't have to put them in, in bags anymore. So it saves time. But for me, those things uh, are important. If you simplify bonsai by explaining it in, a, in an understandable way, then it makes it more accessible and easy for people as well. So... I also use this in my soul mix. So what I do is, if I have a, I, I first think about the goal of my tree. And if I have a very small cutting, and I want this this cutting to grow into a beautiful show end, I use a big grain of, of uh, I use a big grain of Akadama and pumice. 
I also don't use too much certain things because I use what I know that they already used in Japan. And where we know of that, that's good. Uh, for instance, if I want to grow a shoen into a bigger tree, I will use the same size of grains in the entire pot. I will draw it. So that would look like this. Okay. Some say here you need to use bigger grains, your middle sized grain, and here a small grain. In my perception, that doesn't really work because if you go with your chopstick in it, these grains go all into this and we get smaller air holes. And what I want with this cutting to become a show entry is a lot of big growth. So if I use the same particles, I have the same air holes. So if I'm now in my living room, if I fill this with only basketballs, I have the same sizes of air holes. If we mix ping pong balls with it, the air holes will be smaller. So that means that we also create smaller air, uh, smaller feeder roots. And it also means that you have to get, give less water. So with this one, you have to give more water and you can get more fertilizer. So that also means that your tree is going to grow uh, bigger, faster. And also that, uh, what do you have to explain? Because your air holes are bigger, the roots will grow bigger as well. Then when you have a tree that needs to go into a refinement stage, then you can use smaller particles because your feeder roots need to become smaller. You have to give less water, but you also have to give less fertilizer. Uh, then I also want to make my mix easy. So some people use like, what does it call, a lava. Uh, lava can be good because there's iron in it and your tree, the color of your foliage can look green, darker green with this. But for me, lava is very, very sharp. So it cuts the root. So by only using this, I don't, or only use lava in my soul mix, I don't use it. Uh, some people like to use it in a mix, but for me, I like to use as less as possible to save time. So I only use Akadama and Pumas with uh, green trees or, or for instance, like conifers and stuff like that. 50% uh, Akadama and 50% uh, Pumas. And with deciduous trees, 80% uh, Akadama and 20% pumps because they have to stay more wet. But if you have a difficult job and you cannot water a lot, then you can add a little bit more Akadama sometimes in your mixture. Uh, some like to add other kinds of things like Kiryu or Lava or other things. But for me, then you need to see Akadama, pumice, um Lava, Kiryu. That's too much work to to do. And in my opinion, if you make bonsai more simple, it will be more easy as well. Okay. Any other questions? Sounds good. Yeah. You, you've been going a long time. It's been very informative. One person wrote, I don't know if you saw, he said he, every person in bonsai needs to learn this history to have a better understanding at mm -hmm. looking at trees and the influence of prior masters. It's uh, very, very good. So uh, if anyone has a, a final question, please get it in right now, because I think we probably need to wrap it up. It's time for him to have breakfast, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, I hope you have a good rest of your day. We're going to be winding down ours okay. over the next few hours. And uh, appreciate it very much, Yannick. And I look forward to seeing you. I'm trying to figure out how to get my camera on. But, uh, uh, I'll see you in October. Yes, we will see each other in October. I'm looking forward to it. So uh, That's right. It'll be fun. Yes. So, definitely. Thank you very, very much. Great job. Thank you for inviting me. Goodbye. Take care. Thanks for attending, everybody. Good night. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye.